In this video, I will be doing an extremely deep dive on the subject of estradiol with Dr. Jordan Grant to discuss why serum levels of estradiol do not carry the meaning that you might think they do. Hey guys, welcome back to the Danny Bossa podcast. I am joined today by Dr. Jordan Grant, MD. Uh, he's a urologist at Paris Urology in Paris, Texas. How you doing, Jordan? Good, Danny. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Um, I brought Jordan on because um, I've been having a number of conversations. As you know, I've, I've kind of beaten the whole subject of estradiol to death in videos that we've done in the past on the um, TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel. I'm kind of a, a bit of a loud mouth and loud voice on the, on the internet on that, uh, which is why I uh, got a lot of people that like it and a lot of people that hate it. But hey, you can't please everyone. Um, I got into a conversation um, with a few people lately uh, who were trying to get into a little bit more detail as to why they felt that uh, measuring estradiol was relevant and why the levels were relevant. Um, and I kind of wanted to bring you on to pick your brain because you've, you've kind of done more looking into this specific subject than pretty much anyone I know. Um, so the topic was with this partic this one particular guy I was discussing, um, his claim was that if you have higher levels of sex hormone binding globulin, also known as SHBG, um, you have obviously more testosterone that is bound to that binding protein. Therefore, you would have less free T and less free estradiol. And that apparently that guys who have low SHBG wind up with higher free testosterone levels. And because of the low SHBG, they have a, a higher level of free estradiol, which is what causes the issues. Now, my understanding of it was that testosterone is delivered to the target tissue, uh, irrespective of SHBG. And once there, that is where it aromatizes into estradiol. So the SHBG in and of itself isn't really a, 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 a factor that plays a role in any of this. So it, 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 tell me if I'm kind of on the right track and let's just kind of get a, a little bit more detail on, on, onto that. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely on the right track. And I'll just preface this by saying we don't know. First of all, the, nobody's done any great studies on SHBG in specifically in people on hormone replacement, men on testosterone replacement, right? As far as really diving deep and trying to find some solid correlations. You're not going to be able to ever do true science on this issue. You can't truly manipulate SHBG in and of itself in a, you know, in an isolated controlled scenario to see what happens. Um, so a lot of this is speculation, but you first have to go back to how estradiol is made. And that's everything we've talked about in the previous videos, but just to, I think that that's where people miss the boat and they go off the rails pretty quick because they're not, yeah fully grasping the intricate, intricate nature of aromatization, right? So basically, if that model is true, um, we, we make estradiol from our testosterone, especially men on TRT, right? You're not making it from your testicles once you're shut down. Your estradiol comes from aromatization. Um, that happens in the tissues, not in, in the blood. Like people get this idea that the Testosterone's floating around in the bloodstream and it's just converting to estradiol and then the estradiol floats around and also does, you know, wreaks havoc or whatever they, they assume. But it, on the intracrine model, the estradiol is made in the target tissue. And this is in varying amounts depending on the tissue's needs. The tissues, they, I mean, it's part of homeostasis, right? They know kind of how to maintain the environment they need. Uh, you see this with uh, DHT as well, not just E2. You, you've seen those studies where they, they took biopsies from prostate tissue with varying amounts of serum T levels, like serum T was given because they assumed it would cause this massive rise in prostatic DHT. It didn't, right? Prostate's maintaining its own DHT irrespective of that serum level. So, and this kind of went into sort of the saturation model that Morgan Teller and them talked about too, which kind of fits with that. So when E2 is made in the tissues, the amount you're measuring in the serum is just sort of a, a conglomerate of all the tissue E2. You're getting a little bit of measurement in the blood, right? And we've talked about this again. So yeah. measuring that serum E2 is not telling you what's going on in any specific tissue. 
So that's that's where people have to they have to grasp that. If they don't grasp that, they're going to continually be talking about serum E2 levels, T to E2 ratios. T to E2 ratio is doesn't matter because the E2 is active in the tissues and doing its job there. So if we go back to SHBG, let's assume SHBG, whether it is or is not active when it's when testosterone is bound versus unbound, it's kind of mm-hmm. important when it comes to estradiol in men, mm-hmm. right? Because how much E2 you have in your serum, bound or unbound, is not producing the physiological effects that it's already there in the tissue doing its job. The right. spillover. And could there be an excess that might eventually cause an issue? Maybe. I don't know. Nobody knows that. I mean, it's almost impossible to control for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I read the, the interaction you had with the gentleman on Reddit and he, he's equating aromatized estradiol with taking exogenous estradiol. Cause he kind of straw manned you about, Oh, you're telling me you can just give a man X amount of estrogen and he's not going to have problems. And it's like, you never said that it would Right. Like that's yeah. we're two totally, it's a category error. He is, he's, he's I, if anything, I would assume that it would. Because yeah. the body is trying, as you said, maintaining this homeostasis, it's self-regulating. That's right. Is E2 of itself bad? No. But if you're just going to jack yourself up on estradiol, right. that, humus, that whole self-regulating mechanism gets broken. That's right. And then, you know, we know, say, okay, ratios aren't important if, as long as the body is maintaining this ratio. But now if you are taking exogenous estradiol, that ratio is now being Manip- manually manipulated or broken. Right. Uh, yeah, you will, you will, yep. you will quickly become out of balance, uh, yep. and you'll have issues. I mean, unless of course you are taking it because you have an aromatase deficiency, not making enough estrogen to begin with. Right. But yeah, you can't, that's the one argument that people say is like Danny Bossa says, uh, you can have sky high estradiol and it's fine. As long as the body is making it as an, uh, an outcome of higher levels of testosterone. But if you're just going to take, you know, hundred milligrams a day of estradiol, uh, and leaving testosterone where, where it lies, like, yes, this, this, this isn't going to work. So, yeah, yeah, it's complete. And, and there's, you know, and then I get it. There's merit to that because us taking testosterone is not natural. We're interrupting the body's, you know, homeostatic mechanism, even just by doing that. But at least that's mm-hmm. just the one variable. When you start trying to make all these claims about, well, now because we're taking testosterone, we got to control these other things. Well, no, the body's still controlling these downstream things pretty well. And I've seen Mm -hmm. that in practice. We've seen it with guys when we talk them into coming off all this extra stuff and they feel better. And that, you know, that's, that matters. I mean, people say, oh, it's not a controlled trial, but it doesn't matter. Anecdote does matter. All right. When you see these things in real life, you're doing it every day and you start removing these variables and people get better. It's like, it's all I need to know. I mean, trial and error matters here, but when people want to, and I hate to call it mental masturbation, but it really is in a way when they're so focused on all this lab stuff because they're viewing the body in this simplistic compartment model and they can picture this, this stuff. Nothing is like that. They can't even study yeah. half the stuff the way they claim they do. Yeah, um, It's not even just the downstream hormones either. Um, the upstream hormones are the same. Like I yeah. interviewed uh, Dr. Mark Gordon and he was adamant that if you get on testosterone replacement therapy, I forget the time frame. I think he said like within two years, you shut down something like 38 different hormones. Yeah. Um, And he was going on about pregnolone and DHEA and whatever else. And like, I've been on T for almost eight years and I still have the same pregnolone production I had when I started. And my DHEA levels are the same as if anything, my DHEA has gone up. So clearly, at least in my case, uh, these hormones, these upstream hormones have not been shut down. (laughs) Um, You know, so... Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I, I asked, I think we asked, I remember when that was posted and I'm not knocking Mark Gordon by any means. I just don't agree because I can't find any actual support for that claim. Yeah. So, and again, how do you even, how do you measure those? A lot of those are, if you start looking into DHEA and pregnenolone and the, you know, the pathways that are claimed, most of that stuff is also made in the tissue. It's not, yeah. it's not the serum, you know, there's a, they're made in the adrenal land for, you know, it's what they claim for the most part. And this pathway is involved in steroid production in the testicles. Well, that doesn't mean anything anymore once you're taking testosterone as far as that side of it. But the adrenal side, people get so caught up on these adrenal hormones, not realizing how exquisitely controlled the adrenal axis is. Like like you you can die easily when the adrenal axis goes out of whack. So this idea that you're, 
you're they're telling yourself anything about these values when you measure pregnant alone GHA, you don't really actually know the relevance of those. Because again, you're getting a serum value snapshot in time. You don't know what those tissue levels are at all. Sure as I yeah. can't measure them in the brain, in a, in a, you know what I mean? These, you know, they act yeah. like they these neurosteroids. It's, it's not as simple as people think it is to do this stuff. So try well, if you were that. seeing countless labs of guys that, you know, oh, we checked his DHEA, is that near zero? Is pregnenolone right. near zero? Is progesterone near zero? Okay. Right. Ever since we've added testosterone, all these values, even though they're not completely accurate, have all gone to near zero. We can demonstrate that we just right. in practice we don't see that occurring that's right exactly you yeah. don't see it it's all over the map just like a anybody not on testosterone or hormones it's the same it's very similar um and that's where trial and error matters you know if, I ch if somebody wants to check a pregnant alone i'm fine with it um if it comes back reading undetectable you know less than 10 then i might say hey give pregnant alone a try try it for a month start low take it before bed you know whatever different ways to do it. Right. But yeah. that's where trial and error matters. And if somebody eventually feels like that resolved their symptoms, great. If it didn't, don't keep taking it. Don't keep taking it just to, just to get your number up. Yeah. Right? The, yeah. That's, that's the, my biggest pet peeve, I think in Western medicine, the period is this, this idea that we have to chase these markers and we have to manipulate the markers in the blood instead of understanding what the markers mean, whether they're the cause yeah. of an issue or are they just the effect, right? Are they just telling you something about your body? Yeah that you don't need to control, right? And that's what guys do. That's what they do with cholesterol all the time, right? Oh, we got to get that number down when cholesterol is just doing its job, has a lot of important functions in the body. If they're, if they're perturbations in those cholesterol numbers, you probably want to start looking at your metabolic health and liver health. You don't want to just crush mm -hmm. the numbers for the sake of making yourself feel better. And that's yeah. what people do with estradiol. I think more than anything, uh, guys, especially, especially that came out of the bodybuilding world, um, it's hammered that estradiol is the devil. That's changing. I mean, since we've started talking about this, you know, I saw, I think it was um, John J. Sherman, I think he's a bodybuilder on Instagram or something, or I don't know, his Instagram page. And he, he was posting about the benefits of estradiol the other day and not blocking it and not using AIs. And I was like, thank God, this is finally getting to the bodybuilding world. You know, and there's, yeah. there's other guys, Roderick Chavez has mentioned it. I know he still kind of thinks there might be times when E2 is too high, but uh, Alex Kickle is a coach and he's even adds, I think, estradiol exogenously to guys on um, on low testosterone and other anabolic compounds like primobolin. He'll actually sometimes add estradiol um, because it, it I is- I think it's also the issue of the, if the bodybuilders taking synthetic compounds, a lot of them are converting it to synthetic estrogens and those obviously don't have the same effect on the receptors as, as estradiol. So sometimes they have to say, well, because of these compounds, I do have to take an AI to keep these, these the resultant synthetic estrogens to a minimal, because otherwise I do wind up with issues. But if I'm on just testosterone, pretty much yeah. any dose, I never, I never need to take an AI. So the thing is, there could probably be an argument there. made there. There could be. There aren't that many compounds, honestly, that do that, right? As far as the true testosterone derivatives, you're looking at basically boldenone, dianabol. Um, those, that's pretty much the main ones. These other DHT derivatives don't aromatize. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. They, they claim that nandrolone does, but there's the study showing it actually doesn't aromatize. Um, now, does that mean it can't convert to another type of estrogen in the liver? No. And that's, I think you do get into issues with that, but that's no different than like females on birth control and dealing with the downstream products of what they're taking. These non-bioidentical hormones can cause issues for sure. So, right. but in general with testosterone, you know, they claim, yeah, your E2 is going to keep going up and up and up the higher dose you go. Well, I think it was, was it the Bazin study or I can't remember the name of it where they did up to 600 milligrams a week. Um, was, yeah, and, study, they, yeah. And, and they measured serum levels, which again, we've talked about, don't really tell you the story, but even then serum E2 and DHT started to plateau while the testosterone just kept skyrocketing. So if anything, the opposite is true of what is usually claimed, you know, as your T levels go up, up, up to these, you know, 3000, 4000, whatever, the serum E2s tend to plateau because, you know, they suppose you're saturating those, the aromatase enzyme. So the, the analogy I once used for that, and you can tell me if, if the analogy makes sense to you. I don't know if I ever told you the analogy is I said, imagine you've got a winery and the winery is capable of making, you know, a thousand bottles a day of wine or whatever. That's like max capacity, right? And every day it's making that much. But if you just took all the grapes in the world and brought it to this winery, well, guess what? It's going to max out at a thousand bottles yeah. a day, no matter how much grapes right. you throw at it. Uh, I, I kind of looked at the aromatase enzyme as a, a similar thing that 
testosterone is the raw material that allows uh, aromatization into uh, estradiol. And obviously, without that raw material, you cannot make estradiol at all, at least not in a man. Um, but I, the analogy I was using was just to basically reflect that aromatase likely has a max output or a max conversion rate that at one point, it doesn't matter how much tea you throw at it, it can only aromatize so much in a, in a, in a, in a given period of time. Is that an accurate statement? I, I think it's a good analogy. Yeah. I mean, we don't know for sure how it works in a human body, but based on the current models, especially with intrachronology, that's an apt way to describe it is basically once you reach that capacity, excess is not going to be converted more and more, you know, and that was always the issue too, with people used to take a lot of stuff, these precursors, and they think it would convert into what their body needed. Like they'll take DHEA when they're not on anything like men and think it's going to raise their levels all this much. And it just doesn't work that way. Once you have enough raw material in your body, which you can't necessarily know, just taking a bunch of precursors is not going to, it's just waste, right? It, you just you know, pee it out or whatever, poop it out. So it's kind of similar concept. And the other thing I wanted to, to harp on is, you know, because I guess still post about this in the Facebook group. They're so caught up on the E2 and they'll say, okay, fine. I'll, I'll accept that E2 is healthy, but they'll say something like, see, my levels are higher because I have higher body fat. And it's like, and my first question is to them, you're already assuming E2 is bad by the nature of your question, right? Yeah. You're already assuming it because they, they go into worrying about E2 and they go, see, my levels are higher. I'm fatter. Therefore I need to control it. It's like, how do you know that's not exactly what your body's supposed to be doing? Uh, yeah. You know, like, so it, presuppositions matter, like in everything. Um, if, if the papers are true that we've looked at, you know, on estradiol and increased insulin sensitivity and adipocytes and increased leptin sensitivity. Yeah. It kind of makes sense. Your E2 might be higher if you're fatter because the body's regulating that based on what it needs. And so all that is a response. Yes. To the issue exactly. and not exactly. the cause of the issue. Exactly. And even, you know, there's studies that show and people in anecdotal reports, guys who block E2 have a harder time losing fat and they, they come off their AIs. They don't change anything else. And so, you know, a few months later, they're everything's getting better down in, in their belly and everywhere. And, it, and there's kind of makes sense if what they say about E2 is true with the You know, it's a metabolic function. So, yeah. And we posted just, studies uh, online in that Facebook group as well of how, estradiol is really a big driving factor of metabolizing visceral fat of all things. Yep. And guys are getting lean thinking, well, if I have high E2, it's going to make me fat. So yeah. I have to drop my estrogen because high right. estrogen makes you fat. And I'm like, no, it's, it's the opposite. It really is the opposite. And it just, it breaks their brains uh, when that's, when that's said. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because of the correlated studies they've done on people, not on exogenous hormones, trying to correlate baseline levels to body fat or things. None of that matters when you're taking things, right? Like you, you can throw a lot of that, that correlated stuff out the window when you are now manipulating the body with exogenous hormones, trying to figure out the right way to do things, which again, that's not natural. We're not being natural anymore. We're taking right. synthetic things and trying to overcome a deficiency. So yeah, there are going to be issues. I mean, I think the biggest issue I see with taking exogenous testosterone, the biggest complaint is in the libido department. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's very hit or miss. It's very individual. Some guys have crazy high libidos when they get on testosterone. Some guys, their libidos go to crap, even switching protocols around, you know, and it, it's probably because of the nature of what we're doing. We're, 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 we're not doing what the body was designed to do with pulsatile, LH and testosterone going back yeah. and forth. And yeah. it seems like guys do get a better libido response when sometimes they'll have a fluctuation because we always harp against fluctuations for other stuff as being bad. But mm -hmm. I have noticed when people change things, it's when their libido will go higher. So some guys have tried to, they try to chase that, right? They'll try to do the, you know, once a week high dose testosterone. So they will get a fluctuation and maybe their libido will go up. But the problem is some of their other symptoms get worse. They'll get the brain fog back, the moodiness. Right. When they, and so it's a balance. Um, and I think a lot of guys don't quite, and I know we're off on a tangent here, but I think a lot of guys don't quite understand libido, even in guys not on testosterone, doesn't stay high forever. Like, so they kind of, they're already under the assumption that 
taking testosterone is going to make them a 16 year old again when it comes to libido. And it, it's not necessarily true. And it, it may have nothing to do with the testosterone either. So I, I talked to guys, I just talked to one guy this past week. He's, he's going through a divorce. He's going bankrupt. And he's like, I got on TRT and I still don't have libido. And I'm like, exactly. Like, <laughs> no, uh, yeah. It's not going to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were, you brought up earlier about the correlations and stuff. And I, I just want to make it clear to, to, to people watching is that we do see a lot of studies regarding people that are obese, people who are in poor health. They happen to see they've got high estradiol levels, uh, and they make this association. People with you know people with obesity are associated with high estradiol, yeah. and people in, in, incorrectly make the assumption that the estradiol caused it. Right. You know, okay, if if you've got high E two, you're going to be fat because there's this association. So right. I got to keep my E two low because I don't want to get fat. No. It's, it's, it's the opposite. The fact that he got fat brought up E2. That's right. If he lost the weight, his E2 is going to come down. Right. Bringing the E2 down is not going to make this guy lose weight. If, if anything, right. it'll prevent him That's from right. ditching the body fat to begin with. So exactly. that, there's a lot of this assumption making um, without really going into the detail. I also want you to touch more on the whole intracrine, uh, paracrine aspect the analogy that I've given, because I try to dumb things down as much as possible for people. I don't want to, I don't like getting into overly, I'll, I'll get guys like you on there go more technical, but I, I try to simplify the language so that the, the layman can, can, can right. really understand. But the, the, the analogy I always give to guys and is the kind of the best one I came up with is if you think of the target tissue as your organs, your heart, your, your brain, muscles, the skeleton, I said, think of it as each one as a, as a different container. Okay. Mm -hmm. And each of these containers are going to be in varying sizes. You'll have some containers larger than others. Some are going to be smaller than others. And when testosterone is then delivered into this container, it then gets converted within the container into estradiol. Mm -hmm. So now imagine these tons and tons of va varied sized containers in the body, all converting testosterone to a different rate into estradiol based on the requirement based mm -hmm. on the amount of aromatase and, and multiple other factors. And, but now imagine that each of these containers has this tiny little pinhole, you know, le that's leaking estradiol back into the serum. Mm -hmm. So now we're measuring serum estradiol and like, oh, your levels are high. But it's kind of the equivalent of saying, I've got a leak in my swimming pool, so let me put a bucket out and I'm gonna measure how much water for, has leaked from my pool into the bucket. And the next day I'll say, oh, I, I, I have two liters of leak in, of water in my bucket. Therefore, I can now use some kind of computational math to figure out how much water I have in the pool. No, right. you can't determine awesome. how much you have in the pool based on how much is leaked out. There yep. could be 100 liters, there could be 100 million liters. Yep. And it's the same thing when regarding these containers. You would have to literally open up each one of these containers and make an analysis as to how much right. estradiol is in there which yep. pretty much would have to be done via autopsy. Is that I think it's a, yeah, yeah. I, I remember your pool, pool analogy. I would just add it to, yeah, link multiple swimming pools together. Yeah. Link 100 of them together, and then you got one thing you can measure from all of them, and they're doing different things inside each one, but then you got one point where you're measuring a conglomerate from all of them and trying to make a claim about the whole system. And yeah. it's not, you can't do it. And so yeah. it's the same with DHT. It's the same issue. Uh, and that's why I brought up that study about that when they're doing the biopsies to check intraprostatic DHT levels compared to serum levels, compared to serum testosterone. Like you would have to do that with all tissues and it's yeah. usually not done. I mean, I think I found a study a few years ago on, on bone um, and estradiol levels where maybe they were looking at intra tissue levels of estradiol compared to, you know, these other things, but it's not, it, these, nobody's going to do these studies. Number one, why are they doing them? It's not going to generate a lot. And number two, it's not fun to get biopsies of your bone or these other tissues, you know, you know, so you kind of do have to go with, you have to go with the model, which again, models aren't always right. So, but if the intracrine process is actually what happens, which has become a big topic, I mean, since the seventies, um, you know, that they kind of figured this out at least, um, then that changes everything in the way you look at blood work with these hormones. It changes not only estradiol and DHT, it also changes DHA pregnenolone. It also changes thyroid. So people have this idea that your free T3 needs to be X number to be optimized. It's not that simple because T3 yeah. is, is made again from conversion T4 to T3, right? In the tissues, well, that's intracrinology right there, 101. 
And so it's hard to say. That's why you have to go more off symptoms. You have to try doses, see how people feel. It takes a long time with thyroid to balance T4 and T3 for a lot of people. Uh, And it's not always... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but was it your experience as a urologist, as a practicing urologist, where you had to learn um, the intricate nature of, of DHT in the prostate? Because if you're a urologist, you're an expert in the prostate, essentially. Was it that understanding that then led you to say, hey, it, it appears that estradiol has that same property? It or, wasn't, it actually. Ex- I, I came across that paper later on, maybe three or four years ago, um, maybe Keith Nichols posted it in the group or something, which I mean, it's fine. And I, and I read it and I was like, man, we were never taught this in your all in training. Uh, you know, these are in a lot of obscure, you know, studies that people aren't going to think about because it may not have the most relevance to urologic practice in general. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. more on the, these are like cancer researchers doing this stuff. Right. And it's nice to see them doing things in the actual human body instead of in Petri dishes. It's rare. Yeah. Um, but that kind of piqued my interest. And then when I, we basically started looking into the AI stuff and estradiol in general, and before we made our videos, when I just stumbled on all these papers, uh, mainly on the intracrine nature of estradiol, and they originally did these on, um, D- using DHEA, all the studies run in women given DHEA for kind of postmenopausal symptoms. And they started noticing the because the, the women are in postmenopausal women are in the same situation as a man on TRT, right? Their, their estrogen is not being pumped out anymore from the ovaries. Right. So they really only have aromatization. So they looked at DHEA and how that was being converted and started realizing that it's, it's all done in the tissues. That this, this aromatization is not just happening in the, the bloodstream. So right. that's when, and that, that was kind of the light bulb moment, you know, and then you start seeing these sentences in these papers going serum E2 values are, near useless in men right like and, and this is in many papers and you start going oh crap that yeah it makes sense that they would be because you're just getting a snapshot of a conglomerate of whatever leakage or venous return right from all the tissue um the metabolism of all the tissues combined in a snapshot in the blood and that's a big issue with blood work in general because we're trying to extrapolate human health and tissue health from blood markers which contain byproducts from all the tissues, right? right. It's, it's really, yeah. And that, that, that only really matters in the endocrine model in, in endocrinology where the serum level is what is supposedly being distributed evenly and affecting the tissues. That makes sense in a way, like for testosterone, Yeah, but for these other ones, it, it almost becomes a moot point. Yeah. Cause then for testosterone, uh, it's traveling freely through the bloodstream so you can measure the amount of testosterone in the blood and like, I have this much testosterone right. in my, yes, you'll, you'll right. get an, a, an accurate represent, representation. Will that value dictate what your symptoms are or how you're feeling, whatever else? No, but you can still take a measurement and say, this is how much I have, but this right. doesn't work for estradiol. So yep. is there any reason you would see a valid reason why anybody um, when I say anybody, we're going to stick to men because obviously women is a completely different uh, right. situation where it is endocrine for them. Right. Is there any reason why you would see a man needing to be concerned about measured estradiol levels? I honestly don't. And even in the opposite scenario, I used to say if it's really low, it might be useful because you might say, oh, do they have an aromatase deficiency? Even that's speculation based on what we're saying, right? You don't know for sure because they may be more efficiently utilizing estradiol in their tissues and not, you're not mm-hmm. seeing or, you know, whatever. I mean, I could think of a million stories to account for that, but so basically again, if they have low levels, but are, are not symptomatic, right, leave right. it alone. Yeah. But if I they mean, have low uh, levels and say, I've got low libido, I've got ED, my joints hurt and whatever. Well, yep. you don't seem to be, there's not much that appears to be leaking out into the serum that right. might maybe imply that there's very little in the tissue to begin with. Right. Let's try giving you some just to see, do you benefit? Right. Um, I, I think mean, that, we yeah. know people that are, they're taking two megs of exogenous estradiol a day that really, really change yeah. things for the better. And if, and, but I and think that they did it more. Band-aid. You know, that may be a band aid approach because you need to go, well, why are you not converting properly? What is your tissue health? What is your overall health? What are you being exposed to? Are there endocrine disruptors you're taking that might act like aromatase inhibitors, right? Mm. Like, got to go into all that stuff it's not just as simple as oh here's blood work and i need to take this pill like it's always it's not always that easy 
Um, it, it, it rarely is. I mean, we need to be holistic in our approach to people's health, in my opinion. We've got to hammer on everything they're doing. What are you eating? What are you drinking? What are you exposed to? Yeah. How you, you know, all that stuff. And because it does matter. And, and a lot of people don't like that because they just want the quick and easy. I need a blood level to tell me what to do and give me the pill. Like that's our mindset, you know, and yeah. it's, it's just, I see it lead to more harm than good. And my guys who really trust the process, they, we keep it simple and they focus on their health more than anything. They, they get better, you know, and yeah. so that, that's a big deal. Yeah. But then we're still going to have the guys that say, well, every time I take the AI, I feel better. I know. I know. I, I know. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, and I'm not denying that people will feel better with the AI. I just want, I, I, I get curious sometimes. Like, are you not at all curious as to why you feel better with an AI? What, why exactly is it that when you take this drug to lower the amount of aromatization, that it makes you feel better? That's right. And I did a, a, a video with with Stephen actually on on the or hormone optimization YouTube channel. Where I say, if you have a guy who's who's highly estrogenic, and when I'm saying estrogenic, meaning not estradiol per se, but like we're discussing the environmental estrogens, uh, things in the cosmetics, in the body washes, and the shampoo and shaving cream and deodorant. Uh, maybe he's got crap in his water, drinking a lot of plastic bottles. Maybe he's been exposed to chemicals. If he's already highly estrogenic, and now you start jacking up his testosterone levels because he's like, oh, I was really symptomatic, so I got on TRT. Uh, yep. Also, because I had measurably low levels of testosterone. Yeah, you probably had measurably low levels of testosterone because your body was so gummed up with all of these environmental estrogens. Yep. He brings up his testosterone levels, which now makes his body produce even more estradiol, which is fine. But now you're adding that estradiol over and above this already highly right. estrogenic state. Right. And I like, well, now I've got gyno and I've got this and I've got that and I've got water retention and whatever else. Therefore, I need to lower the estradiol. Right. And again, it's like you're saying with the health stuff, let's, let's resolve this foundational core, these foundational core issues first. And, 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 and it just won't be, uh, won't be needed. Yeah. So have you, have you essentially outright stopped measuring estradiol in your patients or do you still measure it? Just I don't measure it on my own ever. Uh, if they ask for it and they, even my guys know they're like, I know doc, I just want to, they want it for their records. They, they like to track and I get it. I used to do that. I keep a spreadsheet and I track different levels and over time or whatever. I've stopped doing that since then. I don't check my blood work anymore, honestly, which is, you know, once a year is fine. It's for yeah. health workers, but yeah, I don't care. I feel good. So I know where I'm at, but yeah, a few will every now and then because they're still being told by buddies or something and they want to prove to their buddies look, my level actually didn't go up even though I'm fat and that's fine, whatever. But I'm like, you're still missing the point of, you know, like yeah. if you truly understand what we're talking about and you believe it, that should lead to certain behavior. Meaning why would I want to check that anymore? Right? Like that's, that's Your just doctor's I, stupid. What do you mean? He's not measuring estradiol. Like right. you should get to find a new doctor. He's a moron. Yeah. That's <laughs> what I'm like, to say that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I guess that would be true if I didn't give anybody a reason, if I was just like, nah, you don't need to do that. And I couldn't back it up, but I feel like I can back it up based on what we're saying about E2 and aromatization, to me, that's a logical chain that makes sense. Um, if this, then this will follow. We have to we have to follow what we say. So I try to be, I try to stick to my convictions on that stuff. I mean, I really do. And um, I don't prescribe AIs. I don't, I will not do it. I, it does, that's one thing I won't do. Um, yeah. I, I usually won't, I won't prescribe finasteride. Um, you know, if guys start asking about hair loss and all that, we, we try to, I direct them to other maybe avenues. I'm not an expert on hair loss. Topical could be a better option, even though you may get some issues with that systemically, but it's probably yep. a lot, lot less than taking freaking finasteride, you know? Yep. Um, so guys, I'm going to link to two videos I've actually done on the subject. I uh, did a quick video about uh, with uh, Dave Lee on the subject of finasteride um, and another discussion actually it was also with Dave regarding uh, things you can do to mitigate um, what you would consider to be estrogenic side effects, uh, improving liver function, improving thy thyroid function. I'm going to link somewhere up here. There'll be some kind of a button that you can, you can click on and check that stuff out. Nice. Um, okay. So anything you think we didn't cover on this uh, subject? No, I mean, I think about this stuff a lot, like just randomly during the days and cause I always try to come up with analogies and I think, cause I think it, the more analogies you can come up with, if we're accurate as to the true what's going on, 
the more people start to get it. So I, I like that you've done the swimming pool analogy. You know, I've thought about it in, in the sense of like, you have a city with lots of different buildings that are make, making stuff and you got your cars bringing all the raw materials, but, and, and then they're doing stuff and you got a little smoke coming out of each one, right? Whatever. Let's just say that. And you try to combine all the smoke from all the different buildings in the city and measure something. And that tells you what's going on inside each building. And it's just like, right. no, it doesn't, it can't work. Yeah. But way. when I take the AI, I lower my estradiol and I feel better. So, you know, screw yeah. you. But yeah. I know <laughs> it's like, it's, it, you know, now that I, I know what I know, I, I, I get it. And it's, it's crystal clear. And I look back at, and I, I just like, I can't believe I used to think that way, but yep. for the guys that are just starting out, um, I get why they can think that. And, 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 the, the, you know, the, the bodybuilders and the guy that are just spitting out the bro science that they're adamant because again, they've taken one, they've yeah. dropped their levels and they feel better. Therefore they don't need any more evidence than that. Um, yeah. But they're just, they're looking at it from a very specific perspective without yeah. taking the bigger picture into, uh, into yeah. account. And then obviously they don't want to stop taking it because then their you know, symptoms are going to come back without realizing just, your protocol might need some serious tweaking and yeah. you might be hypothyroid and have you had your AST and ALT levels checked for your liver? Maybe you've got poor liver function, not metabolizing these estrogens. Maybe have you checked some of the stuff that you're using on a daily basis? And they start like, Hey, yeah. I've been using this body wash. That's got all this gunk in it. And one of them has got high levels of phthalates. Okay. Well, here you are yeah. obsessing over this lab number without even looking at the obvious first. That's right. Yeah, we read, a, I think we bought a book. It's like living healthy in a toxic world or something. So MD and PhD wrote it. And it's, I mean, it's, it's eye opening when you really do realize the chemical content of everything we use in daily life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's speculation that is that the cause of the low T crisis and all this stuff? I, I think it's part of it. I mean, I was having this conversation with somebody yesterday about the massive amounts of low testosterone I'm seeing in 20 year old men. Um, who are not bodybuilders they're not taking exogenous hormones these are good mm. old good old guys they they're getting married they can't get an erection their providers are putting them on aromatase inhibitors alone and then they come see me because they their numbers go up and they feel awful they have joint pain they can't get an erection they don't want to have sex, sex with their new wives they're trying to have a baby you know and i'm, I'm one of the only ones that'll even touch them and look into it um, yeah you know, yeah, we try to exhaust all those options for young kids, you know, to make sure we're not missing something like a pituitary issue, whatever, but it's not, you're not finding that in most of these guys. These aren't like unhealthy guys from a, if you look at them, you know, they don't have Cushing, yeah. they don't have, and they're recline filters and all this stuff. So you, I think environment is playing a mass role because these guys also have very low sperm counts. Um, and it's very worrisome to me. I know some people blow this off. Like it doesn't, it doesn't exist, but. Oh, it absolutely does. It, it exists. And just looking at the normal range of testosterone, how that's changed in the last you know 30 yeah. or 40 years. That's so a that's sperm count. Yeah, exactly. So and it's, yeah. it's worldwide. It's not just, you know, North America. So. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly enough, um, last time I measured my E2 was 70. I measure it just because it's more out of curiosity than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, I have Arimidex here. I've done little experiments on my own saying, I want to see what happens if I lower my estradiol. And I tried taking, um, I tried the first week, I just think I took like a quarter of a mig once. I didn't feel anything. Uh, for two weeks after, I took a quarter of a mig twice a week for two weeks. I didn't feel anything. And I'm I mean, clearly my estrogen levels would have, would have dropped. Uh, mm -hmm. At one point, I tried taking a half a mig. Um, and then I just started feeling unwell and I, and yeah. I just stopped. I'm like, okay, there's my estradiol is here. My, my measured virtually right. meaningless levels of estradiol here. I've now lowered them. And I feel worse because right. my health is in order. <laughs> I take really, well, really good yeah. care of my health. Yeah. And, and so important though, to this is you can't always base it off how you feel because again, we're, we're talking about E2 and different tissues are different. Yes. And yeah. I always harp on that with guys. I'm like, yeah, just because you're lowering your E2, let's say in your adipocytes, right? Let's just make it up. How do you know you didn't tank it in your bones to zero? You know what I mean? You right. don't know that. And you so don't know just, what's going on under the hood, so to you're speak. You're going to have, it's going to take a long time to actually notice those downstream effects of ill health. Why are you, right. the question is, why are you doing it in the first place? Why are you yep. taking a, 
a poison, because that's literally what an aromatase inhibitor is. Yep. Your poison, a poison by definition disrupts the body's natural process, right? Yep. That's what most drugs are. Um, you know, you can I'm Google, really, is Arimidex, which is an example of Arimidex, is Arimidex toxic? Just go on yeah. Google, is Arimidex toxic? Yeah. The yeah. toxicity, toxicity. Yeah. <laughs> just, that's what they, that's, you know. yeah, that's what pharmaceuticals do. And I mean, I, that's why I'm really just a fan of hormones, because at least they're you're not disrupting necessarily the natural functions. Mm. Um, at least but then it's know. the dose that makes the poison. They well, say that. Take a little bit. Yeah, they say that. And that's a horrible, I just need a little bit of poison. It's just like, why? Why do you think you need it? So it still goes back to this first presupposition that you think E2 is bad. You think that serum level is telling you what you think it is. And therefore, you need to take a little bit of pill to keep it in a little range to make you happy. And then mentally, they're happy, right? Because they get right. the nocebo effect. If their number gets over X amount that they've decided, they're like, oh, I get all these symptoms. Full blown panic. And yet I've dealt with all these guys and you have two that we get them, we get, we change their mindset, get them off their AI, get them on a good protocol and magically all those high E2 symptoms went away. And yeah. you're like, well, then it was never high E2 symptoms to begin with, right? So, and they yeah. get it, you know, so that's, yeah, the it's just biggest important. factor that I've seen to getting guys off uh, and, and, and really rewiring the way they think is the ones that are doing a really poor frequency you get a guy yeah. who's got like an SHBG at 12 and he's taking once weekly shots. And I'm like, no, 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 just yep. split yep. it up. And yep. a couple of months later, like, yeah, I feel better than ever. And I stopped taking the stuff and I, I'm, I'm doing great, but it's yep. so weird. Cause now my E2 levels are measurably higher than they were before. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. cause maybe they were able to, I told them like, you need also to raise your dose. So they raise their right. dose, to increase their frequency, which leads to higher measured E2. Right. And they're like, well, how come my value is up? <laughs> like better. again, because it's not, it's, it's yeah. it, it, it's really really difficult to get through to them uh, right. because it, it's an they think it's inherently bad. It's been it's been hard coded into their brains. It has. You know, um, it has. It's cognitive dissonance or it's confirmation bias, I guess. Um, you know, we all have it for certain things that we're just told and we just take it as read that yeah, that's just the way it is. And then you actually start looking deep into papers and go. There's no basis for this. And then, yeah. so that's it. That's my thing. If you have, if, if somebody can give me solid reasons that why we should be controlling serum E2, real yeah. good, good reasons, like not yeah. just speculating, not just correlative studies that baseline people that aren't on hormones. Don't give me any of that crap. Give me actual data, evidence, pe men on TRT. The studies we usually see with men on TRT, AI versus no AI, the no AI groups come out better, whether it's health markers or how they feel. So yeah. that alone tells you a lot. And then everyday practice, we see the same thing. Yeah. So but then I'll, I'll be on places like Reddit or elsewhere. Where I'll say, show me the evidence. And then they'll, they'll go find all the studies where estrogen was associated or correlated with harm. And I'm like, yeah, but you're doing... An, I've, I've sent these to Neil Ruzier from time to time and he just writes me back and he's laughing. He goes, they continue yeah. to make correlations at baseline. Yep. They are, they are observing something without changing anything and say, well, I'm yeah. seeing high E2 levels and I'm seeing this. Therefore there's a correlation. Yeah. He says, but when we raise the testosterone, which is what you should be doing is basically saying, let's, let's make a baseline observation. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is where we're starting from. Now let's raise testosterone levels in order to raise estradiol levels. Now they're both going to go up. And now let's measure what the outcome is. He says, and every time you do that, we only see benefits. That's right. So you can't, these, all these associative studies that we keep getting thrown at over and over and over, I just look at them and, I, yeah. and I'm like, raise the levels purposely and then tell me, did it cause stroke? Did it cause blood clots? Did it cause, no, it, it, it just never does. Yeah. And if it yeah. did, I mean- we're in Facebook groups and, and we're at forums with tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people. We're not constantly saying, yeah, I had a stroke. I had a heart attack. Right. I had this over and over. We're just not seeing it ever. Right. That's you right. And, and I'm glad you're harping on the And correlated studies are fine if you want to generate other, you know, some hypotheses from that. But in and of themselves, no, they're not telling you cause and effect. And in fact, most of these things, you're you're measuring an effect. And you're claiming it as a cause. And they do that. Even though everybody hears it, you know, correlation is not causation, they don't care. They'll yeah. still make the claims. And then what, what you see happen is in these papers, somebody makes the claim as a fact. This, And they'll say maybe this may cause this. Well, somebody else takes that paper and they take that as a fact 
And they bring that into their paper, their research, already laboring under that presupposition that E2 is not harmful. Now we got to do some papers to show that we can lower E2 with aromatase inhibitors. And people will throw those at us like, see, they gave them AIs and their E2 came down. We're like, yeah, no kidding. That's what AIs do. What's your point? <laughs> the, yeah. the question is, why are you doing that? And why, how do you know you should do that? It's yeah. not, can we get this effect? We can get all kinds of effects, right? Like by manipulating stuff. The, what, I'll, what I'll right. tell you guys is when you see these studies about blood clots, heart attacks, strokes, obesity, correlated, 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 correlated. Again, they're immediately thinking of, the, okay, well, the estradiol must have been the cause. But again, estradiol will get produced in higher levels by the body in it's the deep. presence of the underlying condition. Yeah. The underlying condition causes these levels to go up. So you're seeing all these studies regarding harm, again, the strokes, blood clots, and whatever else, you're seeing the two saying, okay, that must have been the cause. No, it's just an innocent bystander at this point. We right. are looking at people who clearly were not healthy because they right. had the cardiovascular disease and, the, yeah. and, and, and whatever else. That's why it was high, yep. because the body was responding to these issues. That's right. Uh, and that's why these studies are so misleading to someone who doesn't see the big picture. They're saying, well, this in all these studies that I'm seeing of all these bad things, estradiol was high, therefore I need to lower it. Yeah, yeah. No, just, you got it. You got it. And that's something I wish more, I wish more physicians understood because physicians love, because in medicine, medicine is not science, right? You really just have observational studies and you have correlations and that's fine, but people take it as being more powerful than it is. Um, you know, statistics are basically descriptive. They're not telling you what should happen. They're not telling you, you know what I mean? Like it, it's very different than manipulating a variable in a controlled scenario to see what happens. Um, yeah. And so you can think of what, what we're doing with giving testosterone, even though it's not really scientific, like it's still an interventional thing. You have to look at interventional studies. If you want the best type of study, even though, yeah, there's still statistics based, you have to look at what happens when we give this, what, and then what happens, what happens to health? What happens to these markers? Oh, estradiol goes up in all these people, but they get healthier. Well, that kind of falsifies all their, your BS about estradiol being harmful. And what's really crazy is they'll claim these papers show high E2 in these people that are unhealthy and not on testosterone. It's like levels of 30 and 40, and they call that high because it's over the reference range. It's like, that's nothing, man. Wait till you get on testosterone, you know? I mean, yeah. even though the serum levels don't really matter, but it's just like a joke that they call that high. And I remember those studies on the you know, Kleinfelters guys, because they just go around saying it like, oh, I know I've got high E2. And you go find the actual studies where they look at serum E2 levels in a lot of these Kleinfelters guys, and they're hardly over even the reference range. You're like, yeah. so that's, it's just spread around as fact. And you have to go look at it and go, well, it's not, I, don't, I can't find that. Like, so you always got to dig in and look at these papers and just figure it out for yourself. But most people just repeat stuff they hear. So, yeah. But the, I think you have the guys watching this and saying, well, he's making really good points. I'm going to get off my AI. Some of them get off their AI and then the issues start kicking in. And then right away it's like, oh no, he's full of shit. See, I just stopped my AI and now look at what happened. Right. And, and, and guys watching, you don't just stop your AI and assume everything's going to be perfect. There yeah. may be things you need to change your protocol, your health, all these underlying conditions and right. whatever else. Um, and then you were talking about doctors earlier. Uh, there's doctors out there that are, 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 prescribing aromatase inhibitors uh, with the understanding that we're living in an estrogenic type of state as it is due to environmental estrogens. So let's give this AI to minimize the estrogenic load. And I'm like, but now you're lowering the good one instead right. of doing everything that's needed to mitigate the bad ones. Exactly. You're lowering the wrong estrogen, yep. you know? Um, yep. Yes, you're minimizing the estrogenic load by lowering the estradiol, but now yeah. you're leaving all this crap, yeah. uh, which is the one that's causing it. If anything, the estradiol is the only thing that's actually going to uh, oppose the bad yeah. estrogens at the, at the receptor level. So it, again, it's yeah. just... Yeah, but that's easier, right? It's easier to give a pill to chase yeah. a number and make somebody mentally feel better or maybe a little physically than actually address the root issues. And that's why I just... And for some people, that's fine. If you want to go that route with certain providers or do that, I mean, that's fine. Teach their own on that. I'm, it's just not my, only is our philosophy. Like I, you have to look holistically at the person. What are you doing in your life? 
to stay healthy, to better yourself. What's your sleep? What's your, you know, what's your relationships like? What's your stress levels? Like we see stress is through the roof on people. Yeah. And it, just, it, it kills any ability to discern the changes you're making in your hormones are really going to affect what's going on in your life. If your life is a train wreck of stress and drama and poor eating and all this stuff, the hormones aren't going to help you, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they might a little, a little bit, but it's really more important to get your life together. Testosterone is like your, just kind of your base. Like I know some people say it's like the icing on the top. I see it more as like, it's like giving somebody a Ferrari, but not teach, they don't know how to drive, right? Like the, it's just a tool. You have to know how to use the tool. You have to do other things. When you drive a race car, you have to know about all these other things and to get it together to work like it's supposed to. And that's where your life comes in, get everything in order and testosterone will help you right with, with your motivation and your whatever. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's more holistic than people want it to be. So. Awesome. Jordan, thank you very much for the talk guys. Jordan Grant, Dr. Jordan Grant, MD, you're all just at Paris urology in Texas. Um, uh, he, he works for the, 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 the hospital there. Uh, he doesn't have necessarily his own practice, but if anyone's in Texas and looking for a great TRT, uh, by all means, I'm going to link the, uh, I'll provide the link in the description of the video to, uh, how he can be reached. Um, and he's also in the Facebook group, the TRT and hormone optimization YouTube channel. Jordan, thank you for your time. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Appreciate it.